Hello everybody, Professor Barth is here, Associate Professor of History at Arizona State University. So today I'm very excited to begin a new playlist here on my channel entitled Foundations of Western Political Thought. Over the next year, maybe a couple years, from time to time, I will contribute a four, maybe five part lecture series on a particular thinker that I believe to be especially uh, essential, foundational to the history of Western political thought. And I'm going to begin this series with a look at Thucydides. Thucydides, the great historian of ancient Greece who lived from 460 to 400 BC. Now, who was Thucydides? Why should you take him so seriously? Why should, why should you, in 2022, pay any mind to, to this man? Well, I think that you will find that as we look at his famous history of the Peloponnesian War, that Thucydides has much to say about transcendent themes that remain every bit as relevant today as they did back then. And those themes include power, realism, pragmatism, and human nature. This is a great work of history. It's considered one of the greatest works of the ancient world. Uh, but it's more than just a historical account of the war. It tells us a whole lot about the human condition and, and, and we'll have much to, to analyze as we look through Thucydides' work. Um, the Peloponnesian War was epic conflict, obviously. 431 to 404 BC. The Greek city-states had just recently defeated the Persians. The Persians earlier in the 5th century had invaded the, uh, the uh, Greek city-states. The Greeks, at the Athenians and Spartans together, pushed back the Persians, decisively defeated them, but almost immediately, division, rivalry between Athens and her allies, known as the Delian League, and the Spartans and their allies, known as the Peloponnesian League, and one of the reasons why this was such an intense rivalry, besides the fact that you know, Athens was a sea power, Sparta, Sparta was a land power, but one of the great sources of this rivalry was that both sides had polar opposite visions of what we would call political economy. The Athenian vision was vastly, just monumentally different from the Spartan vision. We'll take a look at that in part three of this lecture series. But Thucydides understood that this was a... A majorly important war, a war like no other that the world had seen. And so he wants to, rec he records this account. He wants to preserve what happened for, for people like us two and a half millennia later to, to read and to, to remember, to understand. And in this history of the Peloponnesian War, um, in the preface, Thucydides says this, I began to write as soon as the war was afoot with the expectation that it would turn out to be a great one, and that more than all earlier wars, this one would deserve to be recorded. This was certainly the greatest upheaval there had ever been among the Greeks. I am confident that nothing great happened in or out of war before this. Quite a statement. But what a war it was. And, and Thucydides gives us a very precise and, dare I say, accurate account of that war and for that reason Thucydides is known generally today as the father of scientific history not the father of history that that title goes to Herodotus well, more on Herodotus in a moment but the father of scientific history and what made Thucydides historical method so scientific well Thucydides was very careful that his his research and his writing was empirical based in in uh uh observable phenomena, evidence-based. Thucydides uh, placed a lot of weight on eyewitness testimony. He interviewed participants. He consulted written documents. He was present for much of the war. In fact, he was a general. More on that in a second. But uh, Thucydides uh, showed... <laughs> Thucydides was, was very reluctant to include anything in his history that, uh, he, that was unsupported. He just didn't want to do it. He strove for accuracy, precision, objectivity, and, and also importantly, impartiality. Impartiality. Um, he, he wanted it to be as objective an account of the war as possible. Now, he's, a, he's from Athens. 
And so um, in reality, in the history, there's a slight bias for Athens. However, um, it's very clear that he, that he sincerely and successfully delivered a, uh, uh, a fair account of the Spartans from the Spartan perspective. Um, he did not hesitate to point out the various weaknesses and deficiencies, um, the, the inadequacies of the Athenian leadership, of the Athenian military. He's very critical of Athens. And so uh, he desires this unbiased account. He wants to give a bird's eye view of the war. He was very, also very interested in cause and effect. What caused the war? He said, I want to know. I don't want, you know, I don't want to hear Athenian propaganda or Spartan propaganda. I want to know the actual cause of this event. He was interested in the effect of different, of different actions, poor decisions, good decisions. Now, like I said, uh, Thucydides was a general during the war, but he ran into, into some trouble uh, in the city of Amphipolis. This is a, a, a part of the Athenian Empire, northeastern Greece. The Spartans invaded. Thucydides was called to defend the city, but he took his time getting there. He, 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 he took a while to get there. This was in 424 BC. And, and by the way, Amphipolis was very important from a strategic angle. So he didn't get there on time. And by the time he arrived, the Spartans had captured the city. And uh, I did a duck, duck, go search on you know, Battle of Amphipolis, and these images came up. Found out that it's from Assassin's Creed, so do what you will with it. But um, Thucydides was blamed for the loss of Amphipolis. Now he he swore that that he had nothing to do with the loss, but he was recalled to Athens, put on trial, and then exiled for twenty years. And during that twenty-year-long exile. Thucydides traveled freely among the Spartans and their Peloponnesian allies and had the advantage of viewing the war from their perspective. He says this in his history, it was also my fate to be in exile from my country for 20 years after my command at Amphipolis and being present with both parties and more especially with the Peloponnesians by reason of my exile, Peloponnesians were the Spartan allies, I had leisure to observe affairs somewhat particularly. So this was a, a privilege that Thucydides had in, in writing this history that he had, uh, a rare privilege that he had uh, res resided on both sides of the conflict. Now you could say perhaps he's biased against Athens because of his exile. And he was certainly critical of, like as I already noted, of many aspects of, of Athenian democracy. But... Uh, what this allowed was, okay, here's a Spartan perspective. Herodotus, who writes on the Greco-Persian War, more on him in just a second, he, he, he doesn't get that, he doesn't travel freely among the Persians, okay? Um, Thucydides does in the case of, with the Spartans, and so that gives him another additional advantage in writing this history. Um, another bit of information on, on Thucydides' method, Thucydides was very careful to deploy what uh, modern historians today call source criticism, source criticism. So it's not just enough to, as a historian, to mine the data and evidence and, and to look at the written documents. No, you've got to, uh, you have to analyze, you have to evaluate those sources with a scrutinous eye. <laughs> you, you, have to, you have to ask yourself, okay, I've got the source. Is this credible? Is this a reliable source? Is who is the author? Is the author biased? Um, is there a possibility that uh, the information in the source isn't, isn't entirely um, true? Okay, right now I'm writing my second, my second book on um, in the history of the continental currency during the Revolutionary War and the hyperinflation that resulted looking at a lot of primary sources. I've got to ask myself these same questions. Source criticism. And Thucydides does this. Thucydides is very careful to do that. And in his preface, he writes this. Great quote from a historical method angle. Quote, I have looked into the evidence as far as can be done. The reader should believe that I have investigated these matters adequately using the best evidence available. Even for events at which I was present myself, 
I tracked down detailed information from other sources as far as I could. It was hard work to find out what happened because those who were present at each event gave different reports, depending on which side they favored and how well they remembered. So Thucydides, it's not enough to just collect the sources. He's got to scrutinize those sources and he does so. And he does so quite successfully. And because of that work, um, we have a, what we can a fairly reliable and dependable account of the Peloponnesian War, which we would not have had otherwise. He also says this in the preface, the search for truth strains the patience of most people who would rather believe the first things that come to hand. And he's so right about that. But for Thucydides, it's all about the search for truth. What is the true cause of the war? What really happened during the Peloponnesian War? And that is what most interests Thucydides. And so, the war, the account of the war. Now, we have to back up a little bit. A few, two caveats. One, because this city is so evidence-based and focused on, uh, on sources and an objective account, there might be a temptation to think, if you haven't read the book, that, wow, this must be a really dry history. It's not. It's it, it, Thucydides so writes in a narrative style. He's deeply influenced by the uh, epic poetry of the day in Greece. And so this is a narrative history. He's a good, he's a talented writer. Um, but also another thing to know, this history includes some lengthy formal speeches uh, in which you, these might not be necessarily exact quotations. Um, for example, he gives us a, a lengthy uh, speech of Pericles, his funeral oration, which we will look at in a in a uh, future lecture soon. Um, Thucydides was almost certainly present at this speech. So he was there. He may have interviewed other people who were there to refine his memory. But it's a lengthy speech. How exact is that speech in reality? Well, Pericles also, there's also a lengthy last speech of Pericles in the midst of the deadly Athenian plague prior to his death. Um, Pericles delivers his last speech. Was Thucydides there? Maybe, maybe even probably. It's hard to say, but how exact is that speech? Um, and then especially the Melian dialogue. Whoa, what? the Melian dialogue. I can't wait to discuss that one. It's a fantastic dialogue between uh, the Athenians and, and the inhabitants of the island of Milos. And uh, Thucydides was not there. He was not there for that. Well, how dependable is this dialogue? He almost certainly interviewed people who were there. And so, you know, there's debate about how accurate these speeches are. Um, but to Thucydides' credit, he admits that uh, these might not be exact quotations. Take a look at this quote from his, uh, from his preface. What particular people said in their speeches, either just before or during the war, was hard to recall exactly whether they were speeches I heard myself, such as Pericles' speeches, or those that were reported to me at second hand, almost certainly a million dialogue. I have made each speaker say what I thought his situation demanded, keeping as near as possible to the general sense of what was actually said. Now, that's, <laughs> what do we make of that sentence? I have made each speaker say what I thought his situation demanded. Okay, so the question is how much of these speeches are Thucydides? and not the actual, not what was actually said. That's one question. And then, but he does say, keeping as near as possible to the general sense of what was actually said. What does that general sense mean? Um, two things on this. I'm, it's, so the question is, how much of this is literary reconstruction, these speeches? Is it Thucydides speaking here, or what he's actually said? Um, I'm of the opinion, that, yes, that there is some, literary reconstruction here but i'm of the opinion that this is actually fairly fairly accurate these speeches that we will take a look at in the in the upcoming lectures these are um fairly accurate speeches um Thucydides was there for maybe two two of these these three that we'll look at and um and interview participants of the others and uh Thucydides seems to strikes me as someone who genuinely wants to at what actually happened and uh the other thing to consider is that 
um, the human memory was a lot stronger in the ancient world. Okay, today we're just bombarded with sensory information and actually our brains have altered a bit. The brain is, not to go off to the subject, but the brain is very malleable. We know that now. Science has discovered it. The brain is, our brains change um, depending on the environment we're in. And the, the, the uh, human uh, mind, the human memories in the ancient world were almost certainly more capable of memorizing lengthy speeches and uh, uh, passages than human beings today. So don't forget that the ancient, you know, when we read, when we consider oral sources um, from the ancient world, uh, do not underestimate the ability of ancient writers to remember lots and lots of information in an accurate manner. And so I'm more of the opinion that this is, that these, um, that these speeches are fairly reliable, that we can take them, um, and, and I will in, in this lecture series, take them generally at, at face value with, with the, uh, the little footnote of, yeah, there might be a little bit of literary reconstruction here. So there's who says the father of scientific history, but I noted not the father of history, that goes to Herodotus and his famous, The Histories. And you'll not, note the uh, dates of his life. Uh, Herodotus was in the, uh, belonged to the generation preceding Thucydides. We know very, very little about the life of Thucydides. We know quite a bit more about Herodotus. Herodotus came from a wealthy family. When he was a, a youth, he traveled all around the Eastern Mediterranean. He even went into the, ventured into the Middle East, settled in Athens. But in 430 BC, he authored this great work, really the founding work of history, the histories on the Greco-Persian Wars. And thank, uh, uh, because of Herodotus, we know a lot more about the Greco-Persian Wars than we would otherwise. Um, and Herodotus, uh, brilliant story, just brilliant storyteller. He, he could he could tell he could tell a story like none other. He's probably a greater writer. Not probably. He was a greater writer than Thucydides. And so you say Thucydides was a talented writer, but Herodotus, he takes it. Um, Herodotus uh, uh, was not just interested in the political and military history, because to be frank, Thucydides, this is mostly political and military history. Herodotus also looks at cultural practices, customs, um, social uh, practices of, of uh, the Greeks and of the Persians. Um, here's some quotes from from Herodotus that are, are worthy of, uh, of including in this, in this lecture. Circumstances rule men. Men do not rule circumstances. Great deeds are usually wrought at great risks. Far better is it to have a stout heart always and suffer one share of evils than to be ever fearing what may happen. Great quotes. Great quotes. Um, but let me give you a couple others. Two more. I am bound to tell what I am told, but not in every case to believe it. And what does he mean by that? Well, uh, Herodotus included in his work uh, quite a few entertaining tales. For example, he included oracles, the, the priests who, who prophesied certain events. He included those in his, in his history. Um, he included tales that even Herodotus himself knew were likely uh, fables, a mere a rumor or, um, or a legend. Why did he include these? Well, they circulated among the people. And so was Horatius that, hey, look, again, I'm, not, I'm bound to tell what I'm told. Not in every case to believe it, but I'm bound to tell what I'm told. And so he includes those in the history. Horatius, uh, here's another quote. There's plenty of convincing evidence that the gods play a part in human affairs. Now, I agree with that. I believe in divine providence, but it's very, very difficult to prove when divine intervention occurs, how it occurs, why it occurs, at what point. And, and in defense of Herodotus, he, he doesn't, um, at no point in his history do the gods directly act in a way that, but, but the gods are in the background and, and um, for Thucydides, they are not. They don't play any role. Now, I want, again, in defense of Herodotus, Herodotus was a scholar. He was a researcher. In fact, actually, the word 
history comes from the Greek word historia, which means research. Actually, the middle name of my second daughter is historia. Uh, research, and so there's research here. He compiles data. He looks at evidence to, to support his, his narrative, but there's an entertainment component. And actually, uh, works of this day were um, oftentimes recited at festivals like the Olympic Games. Herodotus, Herodotus's work was almost certainly um, in that category. Prizes were won for the most entertaining work, and so he had an objective here. He wanted an entertaining history, and it, it sure is. And this is an entertaining work. This is an extremely valuable work, and no doubt there's a whole lot of truth in it, but there's speculation, there's fable, there's rumor, there's entertainment, and there's also partiality. Herodotus does not pretend to be impartial. He, he, he makes no bones about it. He's, impar he, he's partial. <laughs> he's partial to the Greek city-states. Uh, he's not a, a, afraid to admit it. He's not, he's not ashamed of it. Um, for Herodotus, the Greeks represent freedom, democracy, the independent polis, the free citizen. The Persians represent oppression, slavery, centralized government, serfdom. Okay? Uh, and, and he's not entirely incorrect about that, but it colors his history. It impacts the writing, okay? Uh, and, and Thucydides strives for the very opposite. He wants to give as impartial, as accurate of an account as possible. Thucydides takes a bit of a shot at Herodotus in his preface. Take a look at this quote. This history may not be the most delightful to hear, since there is no mythology in it, but those who want to look into the truth of what was done in the past, which, given the human condition, will recur in the future, either in the same fashion or nearly so, those readers will find this history valuable enough, as this was composed to be a lasting possession and not to be heard for a prize at the moment of a contest. A lasting possession. Those who are interested in the truth. Now, in truth, both of these are lasting possessions. They're both classics in the literature. Excellent, brilliant works, uh, literary works, works of history. Um, but for this lecture series, we're going to take a look at, we're going to dive into Thucydides, the history of the Peloponnesian War. And for part two, we're going to take a look at what Thucydides has to say about human nature. Oh, he has a whole lot to say about human nature. You get a bit of that here in this quote, the human condition. And so lots to glean from that. So we'll check that out for part two. See you there. Bye.